Good afternoon or morning. I'm Allison Steiner from the University of Michigan. Thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to start off this first session of the workshop. Um, and I was going to try to provide an atmospheric perspective on how we can understand and capture feedbacks between the land surface and the atmosphere. Um, so depending upon what type of research you're interested in, um, we can think about the land atmosphere interface from two different yet overlapping perspectives. In both of these cases, either the biogeophysical or the biogeochemical, the terrestrial biosphere can act as a lower boundary condition for the atmosphere. At least that's how atmospheric scientists tend to see it. Um, and we can think about the feedbacks between the land surface and the atmosphere influencing both biogeophysical and biogeochemical processes. Um, at the center of my diagram is a representation of the Flex Tower because this is a DOE Ameriflex workshop and this probably represents a primary observing um, perspective of many of you listening. Um, so these feedbacks between the land surface and the atmosphere can be important from the perspective of global ch climate change because they can introduce uncertainties and unknowns into our understanding of the earth system. As extreme temperature and precipitation events are likely to increase under increasing greenhouse gas concentrations, these feedbacks have the possibility to exacerbate or mitigate these extreme events. Therefore, understanding and predicting these feedbacks and models is important to improve our ability to understand future climate impacts. So when I refer, refer, refer to biogeophysical feedbacks, I'm primarily talking about the surface energy and water budgets. So for the surface energy budget depicted here, the flux towers represent an excellent opportunity to obtain observations of the surface energy budget primarily by measuring how much energy comes in from the atmosphere as incoming solar radiation and how that heats or is absorbed at the surface of the earth um, when we take off what's been reflected. And this is often known as the net radiation or r sub m. Um, some of the energy can go into the ground, but most of it is then returned to the atmosphere either via sensible heat flux or latent heat fluxes. And the partitioning um, between these uh, two different types of fluxes is driven by the surface vegetation type, as well as the amount of moisture available and the turbulence that's occurring at the surface in the planetary boundary layer. Um, a second part of the biogeophysical feedback representation is the water cycle. Um, and now we're thinking about now a budget of water, not energy across this interface. And in this case, the sole input from the atmosphere is, is coming as precipitation rather than the solid or liquid form. Um, some of that can be intercepted by the forest canopy, by vegetation, but most of it probably makes it through and falls through the canopy to reach the surface where it can be infiltrated into the ground and drive the local soil moisture, or if the ground is saturated or you might have extremely intense precipitation, uh, some of that moisture may run off um, to points unknown. The moisture can then be returned back to the atmosphere via, via the latent heat flux. Um, and frequently this is partitioned. The latent heat flux can be represented with transpiration components, a canopy evaporation component from moisture at the surface of the canopy, or also coming directly from the ground. Um, and so from the perspective when vegetation is present, most of that latent heat flux is being returned as transpiration. Um, a second part uh, of that, or from the bio is looking at things from the biogeochemical side. And so in this case, we can think about our flux tower as looking at this interface across where we can observe the exchange of trace gases and aerosols. And so specifically the interpretation of eddy covariance techniques to infer carbon fluxes has been pretty transformative in our ability to understand the exchange of carbon between the atmosphere and the terrestrial biosphere. Um, similarly, nitrogen is another nutrient um, that can be used in terms of fluxes, although ob observing that in both space and time is not as common as carbon dioxide. Um, and also from the perspective of atmospheric chemistry, many people use towers um, to understand the role of shorter lived gases and aerosols, including that of biogenic volatile organic compound emissions or biogenic VOCs, as well as the emission from vegetation of primary biological aerosol particles. Um, these tends, from the trace gas perspective, most of these shorter lived gases and aerosols are not consistently observed at Ameriflux towers, yet they could provide an important role in the land atmosphere feedback system. For example, biogenic VOCs can be oxidized in the atmosphere and undergo 
uh, partitioning themselves to form particles in the form of secondary organic aerosols. And together, either these primary emissions or the secondary aerosols formed in the atmosphere um, can act or have the potential to have a direct effect where they can scatter or absorb incoming solar radiation affecting processes in the surface energy budget through the net radiation. And then they can also have an indirect on climate um, by acting as cloud condensation nuclei in warm clouds or as ice nucleating particles um, for cold clouds. Um, you're gonna hear more about these aerosol cloud interactions in tomorrow's session on clouds and aerosols with talks by Ji Wen Fan and Celia Fayola. Um, so one of our tasks in this workshop is to try to improve our observing frameworks for understanding these land atmosphere interactions with the goal of using them to feed into models to improve the predictive capability of our system modeling frameworks. Um, so typically when we try to understand these feedbacks, we might use a suite of observing capabilities. Um, and we have ground-based tower networks to represent in situ measurements. And we have some of those located across the United States. Um, if we start to move up into the atmosphere, we can um, use balloons for SONs to understand what's happening in the planetary boundary layer, as well as, as, well as aircraft. And then there's a, also a growing use of satellite-based instruments to infer information about the atmospheric column on the surface. Um, and what, what these observations allow us to do is to develop or improve upon existing parameterizations that are used in models, as well as evaluate them. Um, so in terms of um, the rest of my time today, um, I want to kind of focus on a couple questions as, you know, one, I think most of you are coming from the perspective of trying to understand processes that drive these biosphere atmosphere feedbacks and observations and using models are certainly components of that. Um, and then the second question is what challenges ex ex uh, exist in identifying these feedbacks. And so I'll talk about this a little bit from the perspective of thinking about how we can understand local versus non-local forcings. And then finally, we have this question about that we're using as the overall structure of the workshop is trying to understand what opportunities could improve their representation in predictive models. Um, okay, so with that, I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about the atmospheric boundary layer both in terms of its diurnal evolution, as well as some of its unique properties. So with respect to the, the planetary boundary layer, um, we tend to see relatively low planetary boundary layer heights um, at the nighttime. And we really start to see that change as the sun rises and we see surface heating from those sensible and latent heat fluxes that increase the turbulent mixing with the boundary layer and push up that mixing in the higher boundary layer heights. Um, along the sort of line of the planetary boundary layer, we can have an entrainment zone where we're often mixing in air from, uh, from above, either from the residual layer during this morning time transition, or potentially even during the daytime from the free troposphere. Um, and depending upon the amount of moisture we have um, and the atmospheric conditions, we can form clouds. Um, these can be either shallow convective clouds or under some cases we can also see deep convection. And that mixing will continue throughout the day um, until the sun goes down and we start to see this decrease over time. And at that point in time, we often say what's, we have sort of a residual layer that will form. Um, it's important to note that this mixing, I think from the diurnal perspective tends not to be symmetric and that we might see a slow gradual buildup in the morning. And then sometimes it's often viewed as a sharp drop off at nighttime. Um, and so sometimes you'll hear people refer to this as a collapse of the planetary boundary layer. This probably isn't the best term as it suggests that it's like a roof that might be smushing down and compressing whatever is below. But in fact, it's a lot more like turning the heat off of a boiling pot of water. So if you have a pot of water on the stove that's boiling at full speed and you turn off the heat source, you start to see that weakening of the convection and essentially a cessation. And then you'll see a stratification layer still as that lower surface would still be warm. And so this is essentially what we're seeing here within the residual layer. So the air that was previously well mixed in the daytime convective boundary layer is sort of hanging around and we see a sharper transition across this, bar, this um, what we would call the nocturnal boundary layer. Sometimes that, those conditions are very stable. So sometimes you'll hear that referred to as the stable nocturnal boundary layer. Um, this is relatively shallow, maybe about 50 to 300 meters in depth. And you can have intermittent turbulence in this case or gravity waves and radiative cooling from the surface. And so as most of you are probably familiar with in terms of um, interpreting and understanding eddy covariance data, this day to nighttime transition can often create very unusual conditions around the land atmosphere fluxes and interpretation of this time period is often very challenging. 
Um, so this, this diagram from Stoll sort of relies heavily on the fact that we have local forcing that are driving this behavior with the planetary boundary layer. And I think that this is, in fact, what most people think about when we think about land and atmosphere feedbacks, where you have a very coupled land surface that is driving conditions within the boundary layer. Um, and that local forcing is really driven in many cases by your sensible and latent heat flux and the ratio that you have between the two of those. Sometimes this is referred to as the evaporative fraction where you have um, latent heat over the total the evaporative fraction, which is the ratio of latent heat to the total surface heating. Um, and I think you're going to hear Pierre Gentine talk about that in the next talk as well. Um, so generally, when we have this sort of strong local surface heating that drives these fluxes back into the atmosphere, that drives a lot of convection and well, well mixed air within the planetary boundary layer. Um, a lot of that mixing is really thought to occur if we look at output from LES models in the sort of upper half. So you're going to be using that to drive the mixing of different compounds away from the surface and up into the planetary boundary layer. Um, but it's also important to remember, especially when you take the, the flux tower perspective, that we can also have that not all these forcings are going to be local. And in many cases, we have strong frontal systems that can increase advection to the site. And so, you know, most of you who have worked with flux tower data are aware of what is considered the footprint of the, the tower and sites tend to be selected to minimize the influence of advection. And we make the assumption that the area around the tower is relatively homogeneous, such as whatever air in is coming in is equal to the flux that's going out. Um, now, interestingly, advection can also change the type of turbulence we might be generating. Instead of being perfectly surface-driven buoyant turbulence, we might have more mechanically driven turbulence, where if we have winds that are pushing in, that might be creating wind shear, which is then driving that mixing. Um, and so it's not the case um, that we wouldn't have a planetary boundary layer and strong mixing in those cases, but it might not have such a strong reliance on local forcings. Um, so one unique example of this is the role of low-level jets. And so one example is in the US in the nighttime in the Southern Great Plains, there's a strong nocturnal jet that sort of goes right along the top of this region and can generate a lot of mixing and is also very important for moisture advection into the Central Great Plains. Um, so now I wanted to give a couple examples of how this local versus non-local perspective can influence pr uh, properties that can influence the biogeochemical and biogeophysical feedbacks. Um, so the first one I'd like to start with is precipitation. Um, and so this is a figure um, from a recent paper by Joe Santinello, who's going to be talking later this morning about looking at these types of local feedbacks between the land surface and the atmosphere. And in this case, the trigger is a change in soil moisture, which can drive a change in that evaporative fraction that influences the height of the planetary boundary layer and the entrainment rates, and also can influence the formation of precipitation clouds, which then feeds back to the surface and changes the soil moisture. And so this, I think, is a, a kind of feedback that most people are very familiar with. But it's important to remember that not all the moisture is directly coming from that local evaporation. Sometimes that local evaporation is often known as the precipitation recycling ratio, where you might have you try to estimate how that much of that precipitation is coming from a local evaporative source. But in fact, a lot of it can be non-local as well. Moisture invection can be very important. In this paper um, by Wei and Dermeyer that was published in 2019, they looked globally at different sources of moisture and found that the regions in the red boxes were actually much more controlled by non-local soil moisture sources that were then influencing the precipitation. So not every feedback is going to be local. And that's this example um, showing you how the Northeastern part of the US northeastern part of the United States is actually more influenced by remote sources than the local. Um, similarly, we can see the same type of feedback cycle that's evident for, for temperature. Um, and so in this case, the local temperature feedbacks are driven by um, drying soil. So this is a case um, from the Schumacher paper where they looked at soil drying, right? And so as the soil starts to dry, you're shifting that partitioning where you see an increase in the sensible heat and a decrease in late heat that increases the height of the planetary boundary layer and that entrainment zone. So you might be bringing in more drier air from higher in the free troposphere. And that influences that heat and increases the evaporative demand drying out the so soil further. So again, this is another type of an example of how an extreme event can be locally modified by these types of feedbacks. But this paper I thought was interesting because it also sort of shows how you can have non-local effects from this as well. And so in this case, a lot of these sort of upwind drought regions can evact warm, dry air downwind into regions that might be climatologically cooler and drive heat wave events where you can trigger a feedback that is sort of um, the evection is essentially enhancing that local feedback and strengthens the local land atmosphere coupling.
Um, I, another example from the biogeochemical perspective that where I think it can sometimes be a little bit easier to see these, uh, these instances of local versus non-local cases is with shorter lived trace gases. So this is one example with isoprene, which is one of the biogenic VOCs that I mentioned earlier. So isoprene has a very short lifetime in the atmosphere. It tends to react rather quickly with the oxidants and so you'll usually see a very distinct diurnal cycle that kind of mimics the processes of photosynthesis. And so in this case, we used data from Dylan Malay group at the University of Michigan Biological Station. Um, this is worked by a postdoc in my research group, Dan Dan Wei. And so typically isoprene has a diurnal cycle that looks like this blue line here that peaks in the middle of the day and then drops off rapidly in the evening. And as we had a long-term data set of isoprene at UMBS, we started looking at what was happening where we would see these unusual cases some days, what we called it the end of day case, where the concentrations would actually increase at the end of the day after the sun had gone down and then rapidly decrease again at night. And so one of the things that we found was that these end of the day cases tended to happen more frequently when we were under stagnant conditions, when the vertical, um, this is showing you the standard deviation of the vertical velocity, it's consistently lower than the normal day cases, but particularly so at the end of the day. So we would see this very stagnant condition at the end of the day that was also accompanied by relatively low wind speeds, as well as finally, when the isoprene concentrations start to drop, a shift in the direction of the wind that we think is infecting isoprene poor air into the region. Um, and so this provides a case where we can see that invective conditions can have a strong influence on the top of the canopy concentrations and such that we have to balance our interpretation of both local versus non-local sources of isoprene. Um, so why does this local versus non-local representation matter? From the site perspective, it's important to think about driving conditions for land atmosphere feedbacks and recognize and be able to clearly identify what might be driven by local interactions as well as remote influences. And so I offer this perspective as one where a way we can interpret remote feedbacks versus a local versus a non-local perspective. Um, so in closing, I'd like to kind of focus on how we think about these feedbacks. One is that what observations are needed to understand local versus non-local, like when do we have a perfectly locally forced event versus when we might have one that is more influenced by advective conditions, and how can we use observations to understand that? Um, and then finally, with models, how can we utilize and develop the flux networks to improve our understanding of these processes, as well as with this sort of longer term goal of improving our um, model predictive capacity. Um, and with that, I thank you for listening and I look forward to taking your questions in the discussion section. Thank you.